I was out there talking instead of being where I'm supposed to be. Good morning, Central family. How are you all this morning? Let's be standing this morning. We're going to start by singing a song that I hope everybody can sing with all their heart. I am feeling fine. And uh, I hope it's because you're in the house of the Lord this morning and we're here. song doesn't get your heart going, I don't know what will. Please say hello to those around you this morning. back to your seats. We're going to continue with our praise time this morning. And that's why we praise you. That's why we sing, that's why we offer him our everything, that's 
continue in our song service about Jesus our Lord what a beautiful name it is he has done so much for us as the last song said he has done everything and so that's why we praise him what a beautiful name it is
At this time, the youngsters can be released for We Worship and Junior Worship. So if you'd like to head toward the back and take them down the hallway. As they're heading out, we're going to head into a time of silent prayer this morning. Um, only new things that I know about. Um, Judy Smith's brother passed away this week. Um, so please continue to, to hold Judy up and her family up, the Smith family, um, as they mourn that loss. Continue to pray for Judy with her health concerns. Um, it's a continuing thing. So. Um, a praise, Clarence got moved back into his apartment, so that's a, a really big place. So we're very happy for that. So, any other prayer requests that I may not know about or have not been brought forth this morning that anybody would like to share? All right. At this time, we'll go to a silent time of prayer then, and then I'll close. Our great and awesome Holy Father, we just, we're humbled when we come before you, Lord. You indeed are great, and you are all-powerful, you are all-knowing, uh, you are in control, even when we don't think that anybody is. And we just thank you, Father, that we can rely on you, that we can hold on to you. We thank you, Father, for Clarence, for that he has improved enough he could get back into his home. We just praise your name for that. We just ask that you'd be with Judy and, and the whole family, that uh, you would just lift them up into your loving arms, Father, through this time. Just continue to pray for Judy also with her, her cancer, Father, that you would just bless the doctors and bless her, that uh, they will have a good outcome, Father, within your will. We just thank you for the time that you give us together in your house, that we can fellowship one, to, one with another, Father, and for the strength and the encouragement that we get from each other, and for this place that you give us to worship in. Just pray that you'd continue with us this morning, Father, as we lift our hearts up to you, and just bless this time together. In Christ's name I pray, amen. As we turn towards our time of communion, we're going to sing Life of the Cross.
take a moment to welcome everybody. We got some visitors in the crowd, and uh, we're glad you're here with us to uh, to worship and, and to commune uh, with our Father. I remind you to fill out uh, visitor or or member, fill out one of these blue cards, place that in the offering at that time, if you would please, so we can connect with you and know you're here and. Uh, uh, even write nice notes to me on the back of one last week. To me, not to the preacher. So, at any rate, <laughs> remind you uh, also offering. There's there's more than one way to give. You can uh, give at the offering plate as it's passed by. You can give in the offering box as you uh, go at any time. You can just place it in that on that beam there as you exit. Or there is the online option. If you go to our website, GaringCentralChurch.org, uh, you can figure out how to give through that, which is what some of the young people like to do. So we encourage you to do that. So uh, lots of options. And as you partake in communion, remind you that our, as those are passed, they're double cupped with uh, bread at the bottom, juice on the top. Just take it out and pass the tray on down. Take your time uh, if you so desire to partake. And when you feel the time is right and you've prepared your heart and examined yourself um, before God, uh, you can partake and then uh, dispose of the, the cups at the receptacles at the end of each pew. So there we go. This morning's words are not mine. They are brought to us by Brother Jim Dietz, who has difficulty getting out uh, because of his body, and so, uh, but his mind is sharp, and so he shares with us on occasion uh, to prepare us for communion, and that's what we have here this morning. So, uh, um, Lyle has been speaking to us this last month on the topic of the fruit of the Spirit, which is spelled out in Galatians 5.22. The passage lists nine attributes that we gain when we allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives. The attributes are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and last but not least, self-control. He's been leading us to a better understanding of these nine attributes or characteristics, and it seems apparent that they are all woven into the fabric of the Spirit of God who dwells in our hearts. And while they are strong, each strong on their own, when woven together, they become a fabric which the evil one cannot overcome. The overwhelming presence of God is based on the love spoken above. In 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8, he states, dear, dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. And as we focus on this love, John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 goes on to say, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved through him. So when we consider that Jesus is God, he certainly was not sent here against his will, but he came here willingly because of his love, fully knowing even then what was he was going to endure to provide salvation to us. Jesus could have refused to come to earth to start with, with, but his love compelled him to. He could have changed the course of his ministry at any time, but his love compelled him. Um... And he was being, even when he was being ridiculed and mistreated. But his love kept him faithful to his purpose. Going to the cross in our place to carry the sins of the world on his shoulders. It is with that thought on our minds today that we obey his request that we take these emblems in his memory. Father God, we are grateful uh, to be able to come into this place this morning. And to do so freely, freely as your son came uh, to uh, live the perfect life and to become that sacrifice for us. And to, to, through that and through his love of, persuading, of pursuing that mission, 
to give his life for us, a ransom for many. Uh, we are so grateful. So, Father, as we uh, partake and as we communion with you, as we uh, partake of the, the bread and the cup, reminding us of his body and his blood that was shed for us, may we also ponder the thought of his love, love for us and love for the world. And that if we do not love, we do not know you, how powerful that verse is. So, Father, may we love like you love. So we pray these things in Jesus' name and because he lives. Amen. Good morning, my church family. Tithing is an expression of our gratitude for what God has done in our lives. Tithing is an act acknowledging his goodness and faithfulness. When we give with a grateful heart, we cultivate a life and a mindset that everything that we have comes from God's hands. Our gracious, mighty Father, you are the Alpha, the Omega. You are awesome. You are so gracious. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for whatever you have given us came from your hands. As we bring our tithes and our offerings into your storehouse, Bless the giver, bless the gift, 
And we thank you for giving us this opportunity to give back to you. Amen. to step on that stool so I could see over everybody, you know, because I, I have such a hard time being high. Thought maybe Ann was coming up to have a few words. <laughs> if you missed uh, Sunday school uh, this morning uh, and you'd like to just have a time uh, with Danny Larson or one of uh, his uh, students uh, today, Libby or Noah, they'll be out in the foyer after services. They have a little display out there. But uh, we were blessed uh, during Sunday school to, to have a P Pine Haven presentation. Pine Haven's a ministry we've supported here at Central for lots of years. Um, as far as Danny Larson goes, I've known Danny for many, many years. Matter of fact, when I first got to know Danny, he was coming to Little Rockies camps as uh, sort of a student helper. He'd come with his parents. His parents would come representing Pine Haven at, in those days, and he was um, always uh, a little mischievous, but always a good worker. So put him in charge of the building the campfire and things like that, and he, he, he was good. So, But um, anyway, it's nice to see Danny now, uh, grown up, and married, and children, doing ministry that his grandparents uh, started. And um, I like that picture of your grandpa, by the way, in the bucket of that tractor. And he had to be in his 90s when that picture was taken. Uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's a good photo. Of course, uh, his, both his grandparents have gone to be, be with Jesus over the last couple of years. And so, um, but they were the ones that pioneered Pine Haven Children's Ranch and the work continues on. So anyway, we're glad to have them here this week and with us. Crystal and Kelly Sandberg will still be out in the foyer at the, at the end of this service. If you're still wanting to get signed up uh, for your family photo, we haven't done a pictorial directory in probably 10 years here, I guess, or longer. I don't know. It's been a while. Uh, but we're trying to do a pictorial directory and... Um, so sign-ups are um, out in the foyer. The days will be, it, they're in your bulletin, but the, 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 the actual pictures will be taken the last two Sundays of April and the first Sunday in May. And then if we need to continue on, we, we will. And uh, we've already ran into uh, those three Sundays don't work for some people, so we'll, we'll take special uh, requests for times that um, if, you, if you need to come in at a special time, can't get everybody together at once, uh, we can make that happen as well. So, Some years ago, a book was written by a noted American historian entitled, When the Cheering Stopped. And it was the story of President Woodrow Wilson and the events leading up to and following World War I. And when that war was over, Wilson was an international hero. There was a great spirit of optimism abroad, and, and people actually believed that the last war had been fought and the world had been made safe for democracy. On his first visit to Paris after the war, Wilson was greeted by cheering mobs. He was actually more popular than their French war heroes. And the same thing was true in England and Italy. The cheering lasted about a year, and then it gradually began to stop, and it turned out that the political leaders in Europe were more concerned with their own agendas 
than they were of lasting peace. At home, Woodrow Wilson ran into opposition in the U.S. Senate, and his League of Nations was not ratified. And under the strain of it all, the president's health began to break, and in the next election, his party was defeated. So it was that Woodrow Wilson, a man who barely a year or two earlier had been heralded as a great hero, came to the end of his days a broken and defeated man. It's a sad story, but one that's not unfamiliar. Today's message is the start of a timeline of the final week of Jesus' life. And I've titled today's sermon, Tears and Cheers. Because as we enter into the events on that Sunday, 2,000 plus years ago in the life of Jesus, it was five days until the crucifixion and seven days until the resurrection. And can you imagine what it must have been like to be Jesus and to know that your, your death was just five days away? That's only 120 hours away, give or take an hour or two. How do you think you would feel if you knew you only had 120 hours to live? Where would your mind be? What would be most important? None of the events that took place in the final week of Jesus were a surprise to him. At least three times Jesus had told his disciples exactly what was going to happen in Jerusalem. Here's how Luke reports it. Now he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and all the things that have been written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles. He'll be ridiculed and abused and spit upon, and after they have flogged him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. The disciples understood none of these things, and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. But I think Jesus could not have been more clear, and yet the meaning of it was somehow hidden from them. They were going to Jerusalem. Jesus would be handed over to the Gentiles. He'd be mocked. He'd be spit on. He'd be flogged and killed. But then risen on the third day. A few days after making that prediction, the day for the triumphal entry arrived. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, share this important event in the life of Jesus. And we're going to try to gain some insight from each of those Gospel accounts uh, this morning. Mark's account begins in Mark 11, verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. So we see that on that important Sunday, Jesus and his disciples left Bethany. They came to the village of Bethpage. Those two places were about two miles from Jerusalem. We know that at least in the early part of his final week, Jesus and his disciples traveled back and forth from Bethany to Jerusalem each day, spending each day in Jerusalem, each night in Bethany. Now, I wonder which of the disciples were the two that were sent to get the donkey. I wonder if Jesus asked for volunteers. I wonder if there was a sign-up sheet. Church is known for sign up sheets. We got sign up sheets for sign up sheets. 
But I wonder if he asked for volunteers. Who wants to go? Ooh, 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 pick me. It's possible that Jesus knew the owner of the donkey. He had made prior arrangements with him to use the donkey. One thing about Jesus was he always acted intentionally. Nothing was accidental in Jesus' life. Nothing was haphazard with Jesus. Everything was intentional. We'll see something similar take place later in the week as Jesus made prior arrangements for the use of the upper room where they would have the Last Supper. Now, you might wonder why it was important that it was a donkey on which no one had ever ridden, no one had ever sat upon. Why is that included? Is that important? It was a common practice in Jesus' day not to use anything for a sacred purpose that had been used previously for a common purpose. So bring one that's never been sat upon. And therefore, the donkey that Jesus rode into the city must not have been ridden before because it was going to be used for a very holy purpose to carry the Messiah of God. And so the two disciples carried out Jesus' instructions, and Mark reports they went away and found a colt tied at the door, outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them just as Jesus had said, and they gave them permission. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Surely for those two disciples, all this seemed to be going as they expected. They went where Jesus told them, found the donkey, were confronted when they began untying the donkey, but then were allowed to continue when they said, the Lord needs it. If Jesus had not made prior arrangements with the donkey's owner, there was an ancient law which required citizens to render to the king any item or service he or one of his representatives might, might request. We might experience something, something similar. I, I don't know if this would happen, probably doesn't happen often, but I see it in the movies uh, uh, where a police officer or an FBI agent would come running up to us and flash their badge and say, I need to borrow your car for official business. I don't know if that's ever happened. You kind of hope they check the back seat, make sure there's not a baby in the car or something like that. But uh, uh, that, that might be the closest thing that we can come to as we try to experience something similar. So the two disciples bought, brought the donkey to Jesus and they put their coats on the donkey's back as a makeshift saddle and, and Jesus sat on the donkey. But then what took place next must have blown the minds of the disciples. Mark continued, and many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. And those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna! In the highest. You might be wondering what in the world's going on here. How and why did the crowd do this without anyone organizing it and instructing them about it? Matthew tells us in Matthew 21, Now this took place so that what was spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, this was a prophecy that was recorded by the prophet Zechariah about 500, 520 B.C. And at that time, some of the people of Israel had returned from their Babylonian captivity and were rebuilding the temple and they were restoring Jerusalem. But those Israelites were still a conquered people. And they faced tremendous opposition from, from all kinds of surrounding enemies. And so in the midst of that political and military oppression, Zechariah promised that God would send a king to lead them out of bondage and into freedom. And right up to the time of Jesus, the Jewish people were still waiting for that king to come. 
as they suffered under Roman occupation. It might seem strange to us that Jesus rode on a donkey because we have a different view of donkeys than they did in ancient times. You know, we have to, a lot of times in interpreting Scripture, we got to kind of go back and what was the signs of the time? What, what was the culture of the time? We think of donkeys as beasts of burden, of animals used for very common purposes like plowing the fields and pulling carts and carrying heavy loads. When we think of donkeys, we think of them as stubborn and not especially regal or beautiful. But that's not how some ancient cultures viewed the donkey. Kings and princes and judges rode on donkeys. You know, during the first service, we we had a judge in the congregation. And I asked that particular judge in our congregation, I said, do you have a donkey? Because I know he has chickens. And I know he has sheep. But do you have a donkey? He said, no, they don't have a donkey. So I think we should do a GoFundMe. <laughs> You know, it was not considered lowly to ride on a donkey. It, it was quite a noble thing to do in that day. Did you know when a king mounted a horse, it meant they were going to war? Did you know if a king mounted a donkey, he was going on a mission of peace? Horses, war. Donkey, peace. And when a new king was being crowned, they would ride a donkey. King David made sure that his son Solomon rode on his mule through the city as a sign that Solomon was the newly crowned king who was succeeding David as king. Need to read that for yourself? It's in 1 Kings 1, 32 through 40. And so with all this in mind, hmm, spring's coming, I have a fly here. The baby one. And so with all this in mind, we get a sense of what was taking place on that Sunday in the final week of Jesus' life. It was, uh, it was Passover, Passover week. Tens of thousands of Jews were coming to Jerusalem for the festival. Some were staying in hotels that might be available or rented rooms in Jerusalem, but Many thousands were staying in the surrounding villages. And the popularity of Jesus had been growing over the course of his ministry. And it tells us in Luke 19.37 that the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. They'd seen a bunch. Jesus had healed thousands of people He'd even raised a few dead people back to life. If you remember the accounts, you'll remember that Jesus had fed thousands of people with a few loaves and fishes on at least two different occasions. Jesus had demonstrated power over demons. He had demonstrated power over nature. Jesus had been teaching with authority and confounding the religious and political leaders. And for three years, Jesus had kept his identity under wraps. And he often told people, and even demons, not to reveal his true identity. But now, as he entered Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, he intended to make his identity known. And so, there was tremendous excitement. And there's this anticipation that when Jesus suddenly appeared on a donkey entering into Jerusalem... And the people of Israel would have remembered. They would have remembered that God had promised to send the Messiah. An anointed one who would save his people. And when Jesus appeared on that donkey, there was massive hope. And there was great anticipation for what Jesus was about to do in Jerusalem and for their nation. Of course, they were expecting this Savior to be a political 
and military savior, but they couldn't help themselves. And that's why they began to shout the things that they shouted, and it's why they, they did the things that they did. The crowd expressed their submission and allegiance to Jesus as their king by, by laying their cloaks on the road, which is what the people of Israel did when they recognized Jehu, for example, as their king many centuries earlier. We can see that in 2 Kings 9.13. Sometimes maybe you've been to a Palm Sunday service where they actually laid palm branches in the aisle. Maybe you've seen that. You ever wonder what a palm branch symbolized? It's like a lot of things that people do and things they do, do and say. They, they just do it and say it because it's the thing their church has always done. They don't have any idea why they do it or what things mean. But the palm branches symbolized victory. And triumph. And they could almost smell the victory and triumph over their Roman occupiers, so they shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Well, what's Hosanna mean? Hosanna is often thought of as a, a general declaration of praise, similar to Hallelujah. But it was actually a plea for salvation. Hosanna was actually a plea for salvation. Literally, Hosanna means I beg you to save or please deliver us. The crowds knew that Jesus was a descendant of David and they were ecstatic that their Savior had come in the name of the Lord to save His people from bondage. And I think what an exciting scene. Everyone was happy with what was going on, right? In every great work of God since, you might find a lot of happy, and you might find, you probably find some that aren't so happy. In every movement of God since, You got the happy ones, the excited ones, and you got the ones that are running around with their wet blankets. The Jewish leaders understood the statement Jesus was making by entering Jerusalem on a donkey, and they were not happy about it. Luke tells us that the Pharisees confronted Jesus. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus said, I tell you, if these disciples stop speaking, I'll have the stones cry out. I love that encounter. The Pharisees knew things were getting out of control, and they wanted Jesus to bring an end to it. But Jesus declared to them that there is no stopping the praise that is to come to Him. You can try to slow it down, you can try to stop it, but, but you won't. If you try to silence the people, then the rocks will cry out the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord. Jesus will be praised whether you're part of it or not. Jesus will be praised whether or not you want to sit like this and this, or if you want to sit like this. Either way, Jesus is going to be praised. It cannot be stopped. And according to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10, in the end, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In John's account of the triumphal entry, he includes these words, John chapter 12, So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went to meet him, because they heard that he had performed this sign so the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are not accomplishing anything. Look, the world has gone after him. Ultimately, when the Pharisees saw what took place on that Palm Sunday, they knew they had to do something drastic because it seemed like the whole world was following Jesus. 
and the whole world wasn't following the religious leaders. And what were the disciples thinking about all that was happening that day? The Apostle John, who was one of them, tells us, These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things for him. Even though Jesus had explained it to them numerous times, they still didn't get it. And let's be honest, I'm not sure any of us would have gotten it either. I'm not sure any of us would have gotten it either if we had been there. But what was Jesus thinking about all all that was happening and about the crowd praising him that day? What was going through the mind of Jesus? Well, Luke gives us this insight in Luke 19. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. What did he do? He wept over it. He wept over it, saying, If you had known on this day, even you, the conditions for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will put up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and throw down your children within you, and they will not leave in, your, leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation." You see, when Jesus entered into the last week of his life, he entered it with his eyes wide open. He knew exactly what was going to happen that week. He knew that the crowds that were shouting, Hosanna on Sunday, would be shouting, Crucify him on Friday. And additionally, Jesus knew exactly what would happen about 40 years in the future when the Romans would lay siege to the city of Jerusalem and destroy it. Jesus wept for the suffering they would experience because of the hardness of their heart. It saddened him so much that they were, that they were blinded to what would bring peace and that they didn't recognize the day when God had visited them. It kind of reminds me of something that John wrote at the beginning of his gospel in chapter 1, verse 9. This was the true light that coming into the world enlightens every person. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not accept him. But as many as received him... To them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. I want you to put yourself in Jesus' sandals here. As we see Jesus weeping, we gain a small understanding of the love he has for everyone that compelled him to die on the cross. Jesus wept. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. A city filled with people who would reject him and vent their hate against him. He was not weeping because he was worried about himself. He was weeping because of his intense love for them. Despite all they were going to put him through that that very week. Despite the unjust trial, despite the false accusations, how do we respond, by the way, when it's in our our camp, when we're unjustly treated, when accusations aren't true? Put yourself in his shoes. The crowds are chanting for his death, the insults, the beatings. Have you ever had anybody spit on you? I'd rather have somebody slap me than spit on me. When you think about the brutal crucifixion, yet despite all that, Jesus still loved all these people. 
And at the end of the week, he would hang on a cross to prove it. Someone has said, we can measure our likeness to Jesus Christ by whether we weep over the same things that Jesus wept over. Do we weep over the same things that Jesus wept over? And if we can honestly say yes, then we're probably more like Christ than we might think. Do any of us weep over lost souls? like we see Jesus weeping over them? Does anybody weep over lost souls in Garing, Nebraska? There are several. Does anybody weep over lost souls in Scotts Bluff? There are several. Does anybody weep over lost souls in the Panhandle? Lost souls in Nebraska. Lost souls in the United States including Alaska, even. Just for you, brother. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's our mission. At home and at abroad, do do we weep over the thought of lost souls? Never do we see Jesus happy when sinners are punished for what they deserve. Never do we see Jesus laugh boastfully, well, I told you so, or you should know better. Jesus was so distraught and wept over the unbelief and spiritual blindness that hung over Jerusalem and the nation of Israel, and I hope we will react the same way at the unbelief and spiritual blindness of the world around us. Mark concludes his account of the triumphal entry with these words, And Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple area, and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. Jesus led his parade right to the magnificent temple of God in Jerusalem. The temple would be the location for a number of the important events of Jesus' final week. But because it was late in the day, Jesus and his disciples left the temple and the city and returned to Bethany for the night. So what can we learn from that account? What eternal lessons should we embrace and treasure from this day in the final week of Jesus' life? Well, first and foremost, let us embrace and treasure the truth that Jesus is our King, the Messiah of God, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And according to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, that there's salvation in no other name given to men, the name of Jesus, that we might be saved. Let us proclaim the truth that Jesus is our salvation. Hosanna to the Son of David. Secondly, let us embrace and treasure the truth that Jesus as our King is our Prince of Peace. And He didn't come on a horse. He didn't come for war. He comes sitting on a donkey's Colt. Jesus didn't come on a horse to bring war. He came on a donkey to bring peace. The most important peace there is. The peace between us and our Creator. In Romans 5.1, Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And third and finally, let us embrace and treasure the truth that Jesus, our King, loves all people, even His enemies. And He weeps over their unbelief and their lost eternal destiny. Do we weep 
over lost people? Do we believe in a literal heaven and a literal hell? Do we believe that lost people go to hell eternally, forever? Heaven, hell, hell is hot, heaven is not, and eternity is a very, very, very long time. The Bible tells us that God does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. The Bible says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but would rather they turn from their ways and live. So in closing, let's have a heart like our God. Let's have a heart like our God, a heart of love and concern, not just for all people that are like us, not for the, all the people that have the same hobbies and the same likes and have children all the same age. Let's have a heart and love and concern for all, even our enemies, even the most evil, unbelieving people in the world. For we too were once God's enemies. Anybody remember life before the cross for you personally? Does anybody remember life before Christ? We too once were God's enemies because of our sins. Our sins separated, from, separated us from Him. But Jesus loved us and died for us anyhow. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And because of God's grace through Jesus, we now have the right to become children of God. And if you're here this morning and you're feeling convicted to get your life on track and you've never confessed with your lips that Jesus is Lord, if you've never taken the opportunity to become a child of the King, if you've never turned away from your evil ways and embraced Jesus who died for your sins, then I'd encourage you to choose Jesus today and heed the words of Acts 22.16. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on His name. God, we thank You for Your love and thank You for this day. God, I thank You that during this time of invitation that you would look into our heart while we are looking into our own heart. We're not concerned about what our neighbor thinks or if somebody else is listening or should be listening. We're concerned about our own heart. And God, I pray that um, as we examine our heart that you would cause us to be uncomfortable if we're not right with you. So whether we need to make a decision privately or publicly, I pray that we would make that decision. That as we leave this place, we'll be singing Hosanna, we'll be singing Hallelujah, because we know that you came to save, and greater than that is you came to save me. So thank you for making a way for us to be saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be standing, please, as we sing our hymn of invitation? If you have a decision that you need to make this morning, please come forward as we sing on bended knee, I come. On bended knee, I come. With a humble heart, I come. Bowing down. Worship you in 
The guys are going to come forward at this time and we're going to take up a special love offering for Pine Haven this morning. Again, I mentioned the pictorial directory. You can see Crystal out in the foyer if you still need to get signed up for a time. Uh, note the time change for next Sunday, Easter morning. Uh, we pretty well stick to the schedule throughout the year, but Easter is a little bit different. Uh, our plan is, Lord willing, weather permitting, to have an outdoor service next Sunday at 7 o'clock. That's 7 to 8, and then 8 o'clock, we'll, Lord willing, we'll have breakfast in the fellowship hall here. And then at 9 o'clock, we'll meet for our indoor service. So 7, 8, and 9 next Sunday only. Um, again, if you're signed up to bring in goods for, to help with the Easter breakfast, um, what, Annette, when, when should they have that stuff here, that fruit? When, when should that come in? Okay, 4 o'clock on Saturday would be the deadline if you're signed up to come. And Annette will be getting a hold of all of you that are signed up out in the foyer for times that you need to be here to, to help. So and if you still want to help on Sunday morning, you, we never have enough help. So, well, we do, but we, we can always use you. God, God always provides what we need when we need it. But if you'd like to come in and help and you're not signed up, we would still take you in. So... That's still to happen. Anyway, sign up sheet out in the foyer for that. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. And there's uh, college care boxes out in the foyer as well. We'll start to fill those boxes to send to our college kids. If you need ideas on what to put in those boxes, talk to Margaret Eckerberg. She is the college box putter together expert. Margaret is. Right, Travis? All right, let's pray for the offering. God, thank you that we can partnership with Pine Haven. Thank you for their ministry. Thank you for the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll be standing as we sing our closing song this morning. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Have a wonderful week.